I am going to sneak out of here and I'm going to turn it over to you. Sounds good. I'll quickly share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Did I go well? Yep, we got you. You're good to go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me um, uh, in this uh, in this uh, presentation webcast. Um, so thank you very much. I'm I'm Matthias Madu, and for the next 20 25 minutes, um, I would like to talk about how to put the security in DevOps um, and make it actually work. Um, my background: um, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior. I actually started my career back in Belgium at Ghent University, pursuing a PhD in application security. Um, I was working on static analysis solutions, trying to obfuscate stuff. Um, and with my PhD, I actually moved to a company called Fortify. And what they were doing, they were trying to find problems in code, the SQL injections, the cross-site scriptings. And I think they were actually doing really good trying to find these problems in code. Although um, at the end um, uh, of the seven years that I spent at Fortify, I realized that it is actually very easy to find problems in code if you never tell a developer how to code securely. So with that knowledge, um, we actually started this. We started um, Secure Code Warrior, and, and we wanted to make sure that um, you can actually bring that knowledge to the developer and make sure that he can code securely. So what I would like to talk about today is on two things I would like to um, look back in the past, and uh, I would like to look at the impossibility of writing secure code. Why are we still talking about writing secure code? Isn't that problem solved already? And then I would like to do a forward-looking thing on how to create secure code and, and how to mingle that into the new way of working, into DevOps. And I would like to focus on culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. So going back in the past on the impossibility of writing secure code, um, when I was creating these slides, I was trying to figure out like, hey, what is the most expensive failure that ever happened? And I came back to the Ariana 5 rocket where um, less than a minute um, in the launch, they had to self-detonate um, the rocket because um, they actually tried to cram a 64-bit float into a 16-bit integer, um, and that was for velocity. And actually, that didn't work very well. Um, it caused an overflow. And for performance reasons, they actually suppressed the error handling. So instead of going up, the, the rocket was suddenly trying to go down. That didn't really work well, so they, they self-detonated the rocket. Um, with that, 7 billion was lost, 10 years of research was lost. So a huge, huge loss. Imagine being the developer that um, has, has written this very nice piece of code that led to this particular loss. Um, well, NASA learned its lesson from this particular piece of code um, because what they've done um, uh, after the Ariana 5 rocket is they try to make sure that mistakes like these would not happen. Um, and what they essentially done, they installed a process. And yes, it's very costly. Um, they installed a process where every line of code within NASA essentially now costs almost, uh, at 2001, cost $1,000 to get that into production, into a rocket. Um, at that same time, the average cost of a line of code was 50 bucks. Um, so, so they figured out like, hey, um, it is better to invest in, in producing secure code, in producing code that works, um, that will prevent huge losses um, in the future. Um, and, and so they, they, made, they, they had their lessons learned. Or as Bob Ross would say, and see what happens as you paint you'll see all kind of things happening on your canvas and very soon you learn to use all these beautiful little things that happen i think in one of the earlier shows i mentioned we don't we don't make mistakes we have happy accidents well i don't think it was a happy accident for the ariana 5 rocket but sometimes there are actually happy accidents um street fighter 2 for example it would not be that popular if if it wasn't for the combo and the combo was actually a glitch. So when they were developing the game, um, they figured out in a certain level that two punches were counted as one. Um, and that eventually became the combo. So this, this, nice, um, this, this glitch actually became a nice little feature into um, uh, Street Fighter 2. Another very interesting feature that we see quite often in our applications these days are SQL injection. Um, the feature, um, it's of course not a feature. It is a, it's a massive problem where 
um, the outsider can essentially change the data in the database. It can update the data in the database. It can remove data in the database, or it can read the data in the database, um, but outside of its own control. It's doing more than what it is allowed to do. So this is um, uh, still a problem. And you would think like, hey, is this is this something new? Um, is this is this the new and hot um, problem in software security? Well, unfortunately, it's not. Because when we were actually decorating um, our Secure Code Warrior office here in Bruges, I found this um, very nice um, signed XKCD uh, that was given by my manager 10 years ago. Because at the back, even more, 12 years now, by now. At the back, it actually says Merry Christmas, and it is signed by my manager at the time. So, and even then, we were already like talking about SQL injection, and it was already 10 years old by the time this XKCD came, came to life. Um, so we're still talking about a problem which is 20 plus years old, and we're still, you know, not able to get this right. Is it still a problem? Well, let's let's have a look at some data. Um, a really uh, 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 good quote that I like a lot is by Jim Barksdale, former CEO of Netscape. He once said, like, if we have data, let's look at the data. If you all have our opinions, let's go with mine. So luckily today we have some data to look at so that I don't have to uh, broadcast my opinion here. Um, one in three newly scanned applications still contain SQL injection in the last five years. Um, the joke goes that two out of three do not have a database. 111 billion lines of code are written every year. Um, we all have a software developer in our title. Um, there's nobody the software deleter in your organization. Um, there's nobody that goes around and it, its sole job is to remove code. Um, well, that's, that's the thing. We're still producing new code day by day. We only want to have more features, um, better things, nicer things. So we're all, we're only producing more code. It's 30 more more 30 times more expensive to fix a vulnerability late in the cycle than all the way at the beginning it's it's obvious because if you fix it late you know you have to go through all these additional cycles and the average cost of a breach almost four million so what is the problem how how do we tackle um software security today and and why are we still not able to get rid of that particular problem so this is how we tackle like, for example, SQL injection today. If um, you concatenate some parameters into a query and your pen testers come back and say, hey, you know what, parameter one and parameter two, they are vulnerable to SQL injection. People can actually steal our database. We have to fix it that immediately. Well, um, it's going to happen. Immediately, you go back, you go to your developers, um, and it, it's going to be fixed because you're open, you're vulnerable. It's a real, real problem. If your static analysis solution comes back with parameter three hypothetically being a problem, because if all the stars align, well, then most likely somebody will be able to exploit this particular problem. Well, then um, what actually happens is you go back to your, your QA people and to your developers, and you actually start a fight between QA security and developers to figure out if this is really a problem. And if it's really a problem, then we may or may, you know, if it's a problem, then we fix it. If it's not a problem, we will not fix it. But first, give us some more evidence. Give us an attack vector. Um, quite often, it's easier to just fix the problem than, than start this whole, whole fight. And last but not least, if parameter four, if none of our tools and none of our white hat hackers or consulting firms come back and they say, you know what, it's vulnerable, well, we're not going to fix it today. You know, and this is how we approach um, application security or software security today. We do it one by one, little by little, very reactive, but we're not taking a holistic approach where we say, hey, you know what, from today on, we're going to code in a secure manner. We're going to make sure that it is always correct. And let me elaborate a little bit further on that one. If you have an organization, quite often you know about security issues. I've never been to an organization where there's a bug tracking zero system with zero issues in there. So you know about problems in your code. And you're asking a developer to fix these particular problems. Quite often, the help is fairly minimal. Um, why is the help fairly minimal? Well, you know what? How big is your security team internally? Um, well, normally, what we see statistic, uh, statistically, one in 100 developers um, is is responsible for security. So one application security person per 100 developers. 
um, there are studies that say, hey, you know what? We're almost at two, two software security people per 100 developers. But these studies actually um, um, target companies that already think about security. Um, quite often, there's simply zero um, for organizations that do not even think about security. So ima imagine having to guide 100 people. That's, that's an astronomical amount of people. Um, think about 100 people in, around you, um, and you have to guide them all on a day by day, 24-7. They can be around the world all day long. You have to guide them, 100 developers. For every line of code that they write, you are responsible. So it's, it's obvious that these developers do not get enough help by the security people. And also, um, um, the developers you know, and the security people, quite often, they are not really aligned. If you ask that security person for help, quite often he comes back with a response or with um, um, a suggestion which doesn't make sense for your code, for your technology, for your stack. And, and the reason why is quite often that, that application security person is really focused on finding the problem and, and, and showing that the code is broken. Quite often that person is not really you know, trying to make sure and help you in fixing that particular problem. Showing that it is broken is, is quite often more than enough. In addition, fixing issues, we all know it's causing a ton of overhead. You have to find the problem in the code. You have to find the solution. You have to research the solution. You have to implement it. You have to test it. You have to QA it, and so on and so forth. So every fix in your code takes a ton of overhead. So what happened quite often in our organizations is, hey, you know what? We make a rank, and we fix a couple of issues, but the, 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 the others are still there. As I've just mentioned, we keep on writing code. Um, 111 billion lines of code every year. There are solutions, there are security solutions that find 700 different category of problems. So it's almost impossible for a developer to, to not introduce problems into the code. And last but not least, there are even more problems in code that nobody is aware of that we can't find that um, our, our white hat hackers or penetration testers or, or tools are not finding because um, quite often it's, it's the analysis is incomplete. So this actually leads to a, a never ending story. The way we fix our problems and the way we operate today leads us to this, this endless never, um, uh, uh, you know, we have to break that cycle. Somehow we have to get out of it. We have to recognize our problems. We have to figure out, hey, what are the key problems in here? And we have to try and address them. So how can we create secure code today? So first of all, what we can do is we can ask our developers to type harder, faster, um, but that is not what we want to do. Um, um, our developers um, are already under a lot of stress. Um, they already work day and night to get the features out. Um, we have to work smarter. We have to address the problems that I just um, uh, recognized in how we did things in the old days. So there's an evolution um, from, from Waterfall to Agile and DevOps. Um, how can we make sure that our security solutions, that the way we approach security also fits this new particular trend? And by the way, we, we quite often say, hey, we're all doing Agile and DevOps and, and we're way past Waterfall. Unfortunately, that is not entirely the truth. You know, we're still in this movement towards uh, new ways of working to address the problems that we saw in the past, um, but we're not quite there yet. So how can we adopt um, our, our security principles, our software security producing mechanisms to this new way of world? Just an example of DevOps, there's plenty of tools over there. How can we embed security in there well, I think there's a real opportunity um, to overlay um, the DevOps cycle with writing secure code. Through each of these phases, I think we should be able to give the right information, to give the, the right hints to a developer to tell him what to do during um, the building, the coding, and, and, uh, and, and, and the releasing of um, the code. In addition, I think we should be able to um, get some uh, uh, points into the operation side so that we get the interesting information to do better, to do better while we're coding. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we should be guided in real time. So um, we should 
embed more processes in there so that when we're coding, we're getting the right information. And it's technology-based. It's not always a person. It's not that one person per 100 developers. That shortage is there, and that shortage is going to stay. So what we, what we should do is we should collectively take the knowledge of that one particular person and make sure that we embed that throughout our cycle and that we can, in a very efficient way, um, distribute that knowledge to the other developers. So let's take one step back. And I was actually looking for the pillars of success in DevOps. And I did a quick Google search. And it seems to be between three and nine. You know, that is that seems to be like the magic. There's between three and nine pillars um, on how to be successful with, with DevOps. So um, that gave me that gave me actually the liberty to just take one, to pick one that I like. And one that I came across, um, I found very interesting. It started with CAMS. Uh, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing, and, and it evolved to CALMS, um, where Lean came into the mix too. So culture, automation, Lean, measurement, and sharing. Um, and I was taking that one, and I was trying to figure out, like, hey, how can we also put security into the culture, security into automation? How should we approach security when we measure stuff? And how should we approach um, security when we're sharing information? And, and that's actually what I will try to do in the next couple slides. I'll try to figure out how we can, um, in that whole um, DevOps cycle, in these four, not the five, I'll take the four, um, in, in, in those four pillars, how can we actually approach security in there? So let's start with culture. Um, culture is, is everybody's um, uh, thing. Everybody should be rallying around culture. If you're building a house, if you have a lot of constructors in there, well, they should talk to each other and everybody should rally around like, hey, we really want to make this and build this house um, and, and not fix things afterwards. You know, we should be very proactive and not reactive in building this house. So it should not be the case if you're all done that you say, gee, we need electricity and there's no wiring in there. You know, so we, we should all rally around the same thing and, and it should be throughout everybody in the organization that you also think about security, okay? And if you tickle that down to developers, well, I think for developers, it also has to fit their culture, okay? So security has to fit their culture. Quite often, the way developers want, want to do something is, you know what, it has to be fun, it has to be online, it has to be games, uh, uh, gamified, um, it has to be tailored to their technology. The way that we have to give information to developers has to suit their, their natural habitat on, the, on their day-to-day -day basis, okay? So when, when you're working on tools, when you're trying to give something to developers, you really have to make sure that it fits what a, how a developer thinks, how a developer operates, um, what he's using on a day-to-day -day basis. That is what we need to take into consideration when we develop um, solutions to help a developer. At the same time, the developer should also see the benefit of, um, of using these solutions. Um, he should understand that um, when he's producing secure code, when he is really rallying around secure code, um, well, he actually, his, his value goes up. Um, a lot of people will be interested in people that can write secure code. Um, what we see in our organization is um, we see actually a very strong correlation between a good developer and a security savvy developer. And I think my, my own personal reasoning for that one is um, a security savvy developer, you only become security savvy if you have the basics right, um, if you want to learn more, if you want to understand more about something, why is something breaking, that's when you move into the field of, of software security and, and building secure systems. So if, if a developer can understand that, I think he will be more willing to, to learn about writing secure code. Quite often, there's, there's a lot of job opportunities. If your organization really cares about secure code, well, it should be obvious that... Um, working on a critical piece of code in your organization will require certain skill. So, and it's quite often the, the, the most interesting projects. So if, if you're rallying around writing secure code, well, it will give you opportunity within your own organization to work on more interesting systems. Um, 
ultimately, I think um, it, it should be clear for a developer that writing secure code is the only way we should do it in our organization. Um, I, I really hope you're in an organization where you the, the, the top management cares about writing secure code and everybody is running around secure code. And that will make it easier for you as an experienced person to also um, um, show you the, the, the experience that you have in your code. This is just an example of, of a cultural fit. I think um, the, the way we learn about things um, has moved on from the past. Um, um, old school training, the way we want to learn a language is, is no longer in school. Um, it's, it's no longer uh, with, with a particular style. I think it's more Duolingo style. And if you, if you look at um, the number of people trying to learn a language through different systems, well, then it is clear that systems like Duolingo and, and similar systems get a lot of ratings, get a lot of attention, and get a lot of people going through their systems. Automation. Um, I was thinking like, hey, on uh, in, in, in DevOps, um, how can we make sure that we get security embedded in there? And there's a lot of automation going in. in uh, 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 there's a lot of automation going on, but how can we make sure that we do not stop um, the developer? Because quite often, I think security is considered as the blocker in the whole system. Um, you know, people say, nah, there, the guys from security are there. We, we did something wrong. They're going to stop us again. And if we're doing automation, if we're trying to automate as, as much as we can, and security is going to embed their things in there, we have to make sure that we do not annoy the developers, right? So first of all, um, a couple of hints uh, how to approach um, software security and automation. First of all, I think... And I'm saying the obvious here, but take some tools that work for your technology and your company culture. Um, it's it's a pretty obvious one, but but all too often I see companies picking a tool, a solution that doesn't really fit the technology stack or not the technology stack across the organization. Pick something that really works for your organization, for your culture. Second, um, don't slow down the developers. And um, I've once heard about the coffee test, which is, hey, um, if you're going away from your desk and you come back, you know, if you take a coffee and you come back, within five minutes, your tests should be run, which means that everything that you can cram in these five minutes, as many security tests as possible, get them in there, but not more. If it's more than five minutes, well, take out the tests that are more than five minutes and either parallelize the rest or move that to a nightly build or do whatever, but do not stop the developer. Don't go over these, this, this coffee test, which is five minutes, maybe seven minutes, maybe three, pick a number. But you know, do not annoy the developer. Third point is it is very similar. Um, you should only, as a security person, break the release or stop the release if you're really, really, really sure. Again, do not annoy the developer. You know, If you're not sure, flag it, make sure it goes to security for review or whatever. But if you're not sure, do not break the release. But if you are sure, you have to break it, of course. If there are security credentials going into production, well, you should stop it. Fourth one, integrate with the way developers work these days, if I look at our organization, um, developers do not read email. In our organization, they no longer read email. It's, um, it's Slack, it's all sorts of things, but it's not email. So the way we communicate with them, it has to integrate. Um, also for, for security systems, we have to integrate with their way of working. Sending a nightly email with updates or whatever, eh, it may be that two weeks from now, they're going to read that email. And last but not least, um, just like in everything that we do, everything has to be in standalone containers for tests, no dependencies. It should run as such so you can spin something up or uh, take something down without breaking everything. Measurement. Um, I thought about measurement the same way. You know, um, Again, we're always seen as blockers. Security is always seen as blockers, not as enablers. And, and quite often that has to do with how we measure thing, things. Um, 
if an OKR for security is how many vulnerabilities can you find in a year, well, obviously you will be seen as a blocker. So we should again move away from these old school things, these old school measurements like number of vulnerabilities uh, that a security person can find. But we should go into a mode where we help the developer and we actually enable them. And we try to get something in production um, by helping them fixing the problem. Not by just saying, yes, whatever, ship it. No, no, no. By, by making sure that we help the developer getting something in production. And it's hard. Um, but for sure, there are ways to measure it the, the right way and to help the developer. And there are ways um, to measure it the wrong way. For example, one way to measure in an incorrect way is, for example, mean time to failure. Um, we essentially want to fail. We want to fail fast. We do not want to lengthen um, that period of not failing because that, that's artificial and that's actually pushing the problems out. What you want to do is you want to fail fast, but you want to recover fast. So it is better to figure out how can we recover very fast and put some metrics around, hey, let's make sure there's something in place so that we can recover very fast instead of trying to lengthen the time by which we are failing. Last but not least, um, the fifth one, sharing. What it is not, um, I think, the AppSec days where we write documents and we send that to developers are over, I think. And if you're still an application security person that is writing countless documents to ship it to a developer, well, I I, I have bad news for you. I think um, it's, it's not going to work anymore. Um, I think today um, a security person, an application security person, should be able to code, should be un able to understand technology, should be able to help the developer and have a meaningful conversation with the developer. And not only about how broken the system is, but how can he help to make sure that the system is secure. How can we do that? Well, I think we need to break the cycle of recurring vulnerabilities. What does that mean? Today, a lot of information in the sharing um, at the, at the left-hand side is lost. If you're fixing a problem in your code, if you're fixing a vulnerability, the moment you close it in your bug tracking system, that information is lost. That information is just gone. And when your developer actually leaves the organization, that information is entirely gone. So what we need to do um, as security is we have to find um, a very nifty technology in a way that we can share information amongst developers. Um, if you're fixing a problem, if you're closing that bug in your bug tracking system, you should be able to share through technology and inform your, your, your peer developers about how you fixed something so that they do not make that same mistake or if that mistake is made, that they know how to fix it. And again, it's not by writing endless documents and PDF pages and wiki pages. No, we should do that through our IDEs, um, through technology, um, through our, our CICD. We should be able to make sure that that information flows to other developers and that they are informed as quick as possible. If that's possible in their IDE, then we do it in the IDE. If it's in some testing, we do it in some testing. In conclusion, I hope I was able to give you um, a, a couple of the blockers uh, of the past where we think um, why we're still in this uh, scenario. Um, a, a problem that was found 22 years ago is still a problem today. Why was that? We identified a couple blockers in there. And in the second half of, the, of this talk, I actually tried to figure out how to put security and application security into the culture, into the automation, into the measurement, and into the sharing. And with a big focus of not annoying the developer. Any questions? All right, Matthias, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, definitely one of those topics that I know, you know, we've been struggling with for plenty of years in security. How do we get security tied into these DevOps processes? Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. So I don't have any questions in the chat, but I'm taking a look at um, at Slack here really quick. And I see there's uh, a comment here. Uh, there's a few different comments. I've not seen any questions, though. Okay. 
Um, so I guess what we'll do is, are you going to be around in Slack for a while? Absolutely. Okay. Well, good. So folks, if you want to ask Matthias any questions about uh, what you've seen here, go ahead, uh, connect with him in Slack. Uh, from a conference perspective, we're going to take about a 15 minute coffee break here. So uh, go ahead, get yourself some refreshments, take a break, make some phone calls, do whatever you got to do. And we'll be back in uh, about 15 minutes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.